Hello everyone, today we talk about Pike and Shocked Warfare and more specifically of second half of the 16th century tactics, the main changes occurring with the gradual affirmation of the musket as the primary uh, shot, in fact, of the diet. Uh, we have talked about medieval warfare in general here and there, my channel is not mostly famous for it because I made less videos about that, but if you check the playlist I made, uh, it's pretty hefty already. But we haven't gotten so thoroughly in, uh, except for some, you know, army description. And uh, I guess that it's important also to back the wall thing with some more structure. So I thought to dedicate to these 50 years of military history some introduction. Uh, pointing out where naturally this period was coming from and going to and uh, mostly focusing in fact on the arms race. So after the mid 16th century as you know the arquebus was sighted and then replaced by a new type of firearm the musket. The musket was introduced on a consistent level already from probably the 20s of the 16th century it was originally actually an artillery piece right that eventually evolved into the handgun but for this reason it was longer and heavier more expansive and more difficult to handle right with all the uh, next problems of production of logistics and so on but the musket had still the advantage of firing a heavier bullet at a greater distance with much more destructive effects against an armored foe. Um, and you know what the deal of warfare was at this point. Essentially, the pike squares were still decisive on, on the battlefield. The shot in the form of harquebus and eventually musket. And don't think that the difference is always very clear because these armaments were also devoid of contemporary standardization. But gradually evolving to increase the uh, firepower, uh, altogether the volume of fire against the pike that basically advanced on, on the battlefields as it started doing offensively without the uh, support of, of cavalry since the mid 15th century from the Swiss model that, however, had been cited by something more consistent in the more complete say tactical systems, the, you know, in the French, Spanish uh, models, etc. And um, that up to this point and up to basically the 18th century will still remain uh, present on, on the battlefield because it could not be stopped by that volume of fire. When the volume of fire becomes enough to thin down the pikemen's ranks to the point of inconsistency and therefore the capacity effectively to carry out the attack further, um, the pike will factually disappear as an arm uh, on the battlefield uh, altogether. And this al also tells you how far from uh, you know any concept of revolution and all this thing actually happened because it took a quarter of a millennium right in order to, to to transition from the pike to the shot practically all the in all this cavalry still having actually a much more important role than is commonly believed you know that the mid 16th century is considered altogether as the moment of greater uh, shrinking of cavalry on the battlefields but which is true but this is nothing to do with the uh, with the fact that cavalry was still there and kept doing essentially what it had always been doing because aside from the reiter um, caracol fighting style was essentially skirmishing uh, and having this firepower or more just mo more mobile based on the battlefield cavalry did charge all the freaking time Right uh, when the in fact the the pike squares were thinned enough or where they were uh, taken by surprise, let's say by some maneuvers, was always kind of a front of attack. So so the rear and the sides, in spite of being in part arranged to be, you know, and part guarded also by the same arquebusiers and so on, were still vulnerable. But the same the same uh, caracolers, let's say, would at the end of the shots throw their pistols against the enemy line. 
and even though they costed a lot to tell the truth and pass through the sword, there were lancers, um, etc. And charge was always charging was always there. From towards the end of, of, of the 16th century, so what we're seeing today, actually cavalry begins to gain steam again. This naturally depends also largely where, what we're talking about because the most advanced warfare of the time was fundamentally in Western Europe, right? So those countries properly the start become, I mean, what we intend as narrowly Western, mostly France, um, Spain, Germany, England, Italy, etc. that basically could afford, statically speaking, the equipment of very large amounts uh, of troops to even just documenting larger battles. If you see, for example, the pictures that we um, that I inserted here, very often it's mostly Western warfare because even though pike and shot was used even up to Russia, still the degree of let's say the the presence of of, of the of uh, of cold steel in many ways, both on infantry, um, both on foot, let's say and mounted was more consistent, there were kind of more ethnic shades um, and so on, sometimes f literally for, for, for doctrinal reasons. For example, Poland also was fully Western at the beginning of the Renaissance, um, but it kind of re uh, uh, stepizized on because of, of the needs brought by the, the full Union. In fact, in the mid, uh, in the second half of, of the 16th century with, with Lithuania that stretched uh, the, the frontiers, uh, the eastern frontier up to the steppes, right? And so the, what we call famously the Polish Hussars and the more iconic ones of the 17th century actually appeared then, right? Not before, right? It would have been more, much more similar to a German arm. Uh, and I made a video about that as well. But just for saying how naturally even needing this uh, amount of Pike many in very large quantities was um, was a, just a big deal, right? For a state to, to be able to afford to train to equip and so on, and so even the advancement in the shot with the spread of musket could be afforded only by some of the most affluent states on a, on a larger on a larger scale, and so these these were the ones that at least or that were particularly rich as also. For example, the Dutch would become, um, after the end of the 80 years war, etc. But, um, of course, the technology was there. But, as we know, technology has basically zero relevance uh, uh, compared to doctrine. For which, it's not that, I don't know, the Tatars didn't know how to use a musket. It's just that their political and social background rendered their military system uh, necessarily based on, on, on another way that still worked uh, and the odds were much more balanced than, than we think, right? Just the future was objectively in Western Europe in that, in that sense. Um, and um, so like the arquebus, the musket still worked by means of a lit fuse which when the trigger was pressed was placed near the gunpowder to fire the shot, right? It was a slow weapon verb um, tense of, of uh, moves that you needed in order to, to, to load it and discharge it. Uh, it was initially, as most of these technologies as they were first introduced, um, partly inefficient, at least, you know, the, the efficiency of it was measured, if anything, on the base of, uh, of absolute standards, like how many shots were missed or something like that. But that's why technology by itself has literally no value whatsoever. What, what actually matters is how you use it doctrinally on the field by how many people, what can do with that, how they're equipped, how they're commanded to use it, how they're trained uh, to be collectively effective and so on. Um, at the beginning it was kind of unusable in bad weather, for example. Well, the musket was so heavy that the, the musketeer had to carry a fork, famously enough, to drive it into the ground on which to place the barrel uh, of the gun. Right? This literally came from mobile artillery. Uh, types of shots, right? So it, it transitioned slowly, right? It, it was something present probably since even the, early, the the end of the Middle Ages, but in another form, conceptual. However, the musket was clearly the winning weapon on the long run, so much that its advent significantly changed the composition of the same infantry units, right? So the 
initial difficulties to fit this weapon were immediately and evidently compensated by by firepower and uh, again it's not that this gun was suspended in a vacuum it, it had been created on purpose right uh, to to have that specific function that would be improved over time and in fact becoming dominating um, so on the one hand the musket reduced the protection role for the pikemen entrusted to the sword and the halberd right this may seem uh, a relatively unimportant aspect but in in the 16th century these units were kind of assault units had played uh, a relevant role um, also in the clash among pikemen as you know there were certain specific commandos that were designed to break through the pikes by literally uh, or at least cutting through through the pikemen right and how this happened within it it got complicated um but these these units would have had to to be more exposed than the others right essentially the pikemen advanced with this uh, expectation again of the first ranks getting uh, a hail of fire and uh, being deep enough to to satisfy in that sense also the 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 manpower due to uh, need due to losses in, in the process this other pocket units let's say that were sometimes also sizable and uh, important also in other fields of um of other tactical theaters of course think about in sieges like how the pike was less usable so uh, today we talk naturally about pitch battles uh, in general given that they were the ones that, that made uh, the thing more importantly but in in the history of warfare the latter uh, the uh, the latter's role of uh, you know skirmishing and besieging etc was was quite intense right and and more so than even than uh, a pitch battle in spite it was definitely a, a much more intense and strategically waging moment in many ways um and the this kind of troops equipped with with uh, with sword and halberd etc uh, actually stopped uh, being recruited right? uh, there were probably at the beginning some simple soldiers also equipped with these weapons and the whole troop was turned instead made up of pikemen and musketeers because they were considered to be as the probably the most effective force like like hammer and anvil the latter mostly being associated to cavalry that also had that uh, that role but still more properly more iconically but the firepower being um, and would become also uh, increasingly more important than the same cavalry as you know during the 18th century what the reason why cavalry comes back on the battlefield is the uh, end of the pike which was caused by the volume of fire and so the uh, relatively not not even so timid reappearance think about the great Napoleonic cavalry charges on mass but um, was still conditioned in a sense by uh, was still largely caused by the increase in in firepower of, of the infantry um, and the breaking through a pike through some you know assault troops also was not um, dramatically uh, practical and it had not either to um, cause like a, a decline in 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 the pike per se right uh, this kind of troops could be um, intended more as a, a as a relic of early let's say of the of the previous medieval warfare more than anything sometimes we say well it's just like the spanish that introduced the rodeleros and this other kind of troops but because we we, we look at the uh, at the Swiss Pike Square, and we say, "Ah, okay, that was initially only pikes, right?" Well, the the Swiss model was actually an exception, right? No other army, practically, uh, including those who made use of the same Swiss mercenaries, used just infantry, right? Look at the French that had hell of you know heavy cavalry and, and artillery. Um, uh, the same sp Spanish, in fact, that in that introduced those troops because they they simply had them, right? Even though they kind of functionalized them at that point for in fact, uh, in function of, however, this pike-and-shot tactics that 
the the Spanish, especially uh, Gonzalo de, de Cordoba, which is easily the greatest commander in modern warfare that created, in fact, the pike and shot warfare as we intended with the Tercio maintaining a dominance on, on the battlefields up to the the mid uh, the mid 17th century was still using these assault troops in function of, of that other tactics whereas at, at that time still lots of European armies had melee infantry in the form in fact of also other kind of troops that were not pikemen right um, the Italians the German it, pr practically everyone had still the, the kind of swordsmen that could be sent in melee so it's not really an exception or anything anew it's just actually the um, this pike and shot being introduced structurally massively in a world that up to that point had made important use of the pike but also in function with, with our troops I mean the same Swiss actually create their own models in the mid 15th century abandoning the halberd that up to our battle had constituted a, a significant part of their infantry as basically all the other Europeans and that's what that's why they made the grade at that point Right, so don't don't be puzzled by these things, um, and it also must be remembered coming back to our times that until the Thirty Years' War, um, infantry contained a a very high proportion of those who were just starting to call themselves officers and non-commissioned officers, and these, like the numerous volunteer gentlemen, were listed in infantry that were perfectly trained how to in in using a, a pike right you know it was actually a thing and especially in the spanish and by osmosis also the broader imperial absurgic tradition um, all over spain italy and germany um joined those noblemen joined the army started as regular uh file and rank pikemen right even probably gentlemen noblemen of you know uh, aristocrats of the empire etc um but Preferably, let's say, at least also by education and by, again, other roles that they performed in society. Also, military ones, in a sense, make about duels, etc., were still armed uh, for even practical functionality with sword or halberd, right? And they really used them in combat, right? And you can never say when such things end, because, of course, on, only in the armies of the 18th century, the sword and the halberd would be transformed in pure and simple symbols of status right but think about you know the nobility was still there and the the use of the sword and horseback as well um, uh, this was the, this weapons became a status for officers and non-commissioned officers that in a pitch battle considering that they were also the only ones who, who equipped with that weapon all the others were musketeers on foot had little or no practical function but conceptually still this word is the noble or at least had become in medieval times the noble web right being originally being the same spear telling the truth the same is is valid for the pike itself i mean there were uh, units of pikemen even in say the napoleonic wars sometimes because they didn't have muskets and so you know forming a a pike line was, was better than nothing you know even though it was not norm normal definitely now on the other hand the advent of the musket on the long run ended up e eclipsing the same pike so much so that towards the end of this period so towards the the end of the 16th century the proportion of musketeers over pikemen increased rapidly right very rapidly at the end of the 16th century the spanish units in flanders had one musketeer and two harquebusiers for every 10 pikemen but less than half a century later on the battlefields of the 30 years war and of, of the english civil war there were two three or even four musketeers for each pikeman right a, a, a radical change we still haven't talked much about the 30 years war per se but i made several videos 
um, as we will see now, first of all about the so-called Protestant reformers that, uh, as we will see, didn't actually even reform much, right? You know, they just had a pretty intensive military activity that brought them to functionalize their armies in ways that had already been, you know, were already in the air and that they just perfectioned on their own account. I made a video about the Dutch army of Maurice of Nassau. Just recently we talked about Gustavus Adolphus. Um, we talked actually a lot about the armies of the English Civil War and also explaining this uh, specific increase in 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 the shot uh, in in those armies, right? Explaining a bit the reasons that had to do, as always, with not a particularly uh, technological uh, reason, except of course the fact that the musket improved. Uh, in performance over time, but rather the type of strategic and thus tactical employment. The English war, Civil War uh, very often being fought among edges um, with an important amount of skirmishing. Same being true in the, the very intense and kind of ravaging Thirty Years' War, where you know, so very intense marches brought the uh, the cumbersome bike to be uh, discarded and preferring properly tactical flexibility mobility over uh, over even just the resistance and so increasing in part the the capacity to exploit aggressively tactical situation for which the shot was mostly used right again um, that's mainly the, the deal right there were states that could afford better uh, weapons and equipment and employing them at the same time in prolonged campaigns that is the case of the Swedes um, the Dutch were just forced in the first place, and so you realize that even just by sheer practice, and even in, independently from what the original, um, uh, let's say, paper strength or properly organization would be, armies would evolve increasingly towards the intensification of the shot, right? And this is true pretty much in all uh, European armies at this point. Um, even the properly the importance of the arms had been reversed like the musketeers represented now the backbone of the army not only for defense but also for attack in fact as they marched against the enemy and unloaded their weapons even at five or ten steps away whereas before they had literally they, they just sighted the, uh, the the pikemen to uh, shoot the uh, the advancing pikes and or you know, stopping when next to the same pike while it was advancing to fire against back the frontal enemy. Um, and um, at, at this point, in fact, even the, which tells you how even just the, uh, the range of the weapons was relative, the, uh, the musket increased the, the, the range, the, the accuracy, right? But at this point, the infantry doesn't even care about that because they marched against the enemy and unloaded their weapons even at five or ten steps away, which uh, not even arquebusiers, uh, you know, with, with less performing weapons did. So that that it's a perfect explanation of how technology has nothing to do with doctrine, uh, or even if it does have with it, of course, by a certain margin, it's it's definitely minimal. Um, so that these troops would shattered the, the enemy uh, uh, pike lines just before the melee, right? And the reason why they could, afford, could, could afford to do that is that they were better trained. They were properly designed to exploit more quickly the tactical situation, even in smaller groups, right? Um, and uh, managing to soften up the enemy lines before their own, by the way, would march in, right? It was not done by the musketeers. Um, but still in ways that had not properly been seen before. And this, again, has mostly to do with the, uh, the command, the collective training these troops were given, uh, properly the, the, the moral and the material resources available, right, that uh, depended at that point on a broader political and social reason, not, uh, not just on the military one that was made on the base of. Um, during the Thirty Years' War, the Spanish defeat at Rocroi in 1643, which marked the end of the famous Spanish army of Flanders, the protagonist of almost a century of European wars, was often 
taken as a symbol of the failure of a military organization deemed to be to have been too conservative who had struggled to recognize the, the primacy of muskets over pikes yet at that date if you actually check the sources even the spanish regulations provided that the pikemen made up no more than half of the troops um, we address this um, let's say this this stereographical bias uh, which is pretty famous right um, in famously spread mostly by eventually what would become in the West, the dominating Protestant historiography that made, again, of Maurice of Nassau, Gustavus Adolphus, military reformers, but we actually go studying the sources, there is no evidence, practically, that the, the, them, as single individuals, ever were be responsible for the actual invention of anything, nor technologically, nor tactically, nor um, broadly doctrinally, right? These were just great leaders, um, of states that were surely provided with dramatic moral especially and also material resources who simply did their job as regular commanders of the time with armies that very gradually just adapted to that kind of efficiency where some things began to appear but some attributions um, to these figures like would actually appear in their own national armies only uh, after generations uh, that they had died. So, so um, there is this broad, broadly ideological, uh, you know, idea that again, you know, it's the these countries that, as Protestants, had es escaped the uh, the the censorship of of the Inquisition in the Catholic countries that instead that that triggered technology and therefore you know modernity, the Enlightenment, but actually. Uh, that that's the fixation that we still have actually from the Enlightenment not even from these centuries where they, they actually didn't reason like that it's a myth that we built after that that made the thing actually no as, as von Clausewitz says it's always about moral forces right and there, surely surely also Reformation counter-reformation locked uh, unlocked uh, triggered some some of these forces but let's say the technological dimension or the specific invention or this structuralist interpretation of this basically doesn't have any historical consistency like you know the art of war if one studies it properly diachronically uh, and comparatively right uh, the the same uh, drill that Maurice of Nassau was experimenting with the Dutch soldiers literally making pirouettes um, behind the pipelines to, to continue to provide kind of a continuous um, shot uh, between the, the corridors and we made a bit about that it was actually you know the Spanish were already practicing similar things at the time so um, it's um, it's really something else and we should learn especially mo I can say that as a medievalist I know that modernists in this sense are probably the worst uh, teachers <laughs> and of course uh, they teach modern history so that's the problem right that we cannot unlock it very often from them but there are even much worse reasons again just selling books because there is the word revolution in it and then people get exalted with fireworks etc but they don't factually understand even the, the, the basics of, of military history that's um, or how, how, how armies perform in the field but unfortunately this is still a thing and we have to to cope with that in a way or another as you know on Schwerpunkt have consistently you know uh, struck, you know, with such ideas every time I, I had the opportunity. Um, what is true also is that uh, in pike and shot warfare, like the problem of adequately equilibrating the pike and shot, in fact, uh, respectively, had always been a need, right, uh, of commanders. Um, it's it's just at this point it was accelerated, right? Uh, you know that in, in modern times um, there is also treatises that are written and that very often also contributed to inflate that uh, that bias that there was some kind of mathematical positivistic um, uh, structural let's say uh, application of this principles on the battlefields we know just from 
from the battle accounts, it wasn't the case, right? The, the point here is that there was a broader reflection that was surely becoming more uh, theoretical than it had ever been historically. Um, but that just um, is intensified by this growing importance of the musket um, that was, as we've seen, sudden, and the employment of which was understood to be, let's say, more... Uh, aggressively functional that it was commonly believed. It, it, it is true that in the history of warfare there is some sort of um, uh, reaction uh, to to novelty, like this is true in every human field, etc. So it's not automatic, right? We don't have to think that um, albeit what happened on the battlefields always had a practical reason. So this doesn't stem also from mistakes, from kind of certain uh, wrong tactical principles. We, the same von Clausewitz describes this in his work. It was true even for for a much more advanced warfare like the the one of the second half of the 17th uh, of the 18th century, in his own times, um, and before the Napoleonic Wars, it was also kind of an uh, uninged uh, everything, right? In uh, in a scale that nobody had ever seen before. Um, so, the potential of Ma uh, of muskets was, was so great that it forced in practice some commanders to reflect more theoretically on the advantage just that could be obtained by training the, the musketeer to to maneuver and fire in groups rather than individually and therefore uh, needing much more than just the musket per se, but needing, in fact, a uh, a greater mm, hierarchy of uh, command, uh, collective training, right, and properly capacity to exploit the opportunities, right. As long as the pike had been prevalent, it obviously was was like this slow square advancing, and uh, also very difficultly. Uh, breakable, if not through properly an attritional warfare, right? So something that had inhibited maneuver. Also, as we've seen, cavalry was uh, at its weakest, right? So the arms that per excellence and definition can only attack and has no defensive capability was reduced to, to a minimum. The infantry was locked in this maxi formations and the, the shot which just, you know, light infantry at the end of the day now the switch is occurring within the, the infantry specialties, right? In Holland, under the impulse of Maurice of Nassau, Stadtholder of the United Provinces and Captain uh, General of the Dutch Army from 1588 to 1625, where, you know, the, the, the Dutch managed to, to defeat the Spanish over and over in one of the most horrifyingly brutal uh, theater of, of operation in military history, the musketeers uh, began to be trained, unsurprisingly, accordingly to a more scientific, let's call it in this way, plan in order to get those in the first row to shoot all together, then retreat neatly and, and beginning the slow process of reloading their weapons, giving way to those in the second row, then in the third one, and, and so on. And in the video about the Dutch army of M M Maurice of Nassau, we've seen that this was carried out very often in much more uh, ingenious and kind of less even collectively standardized fashion than we we previously thought. Right? There were these systems that we identified, like the Dutch, like the Swedish, the Spanish one that, however, when you actually study the battles, you realize that weren't quite there in the same way, right? If not um, organically, while tactically it was something else, and we actually don't have even properly at this point towards the end of the 16th century even a satisfying historiography that tells us in detail what, what happens, right? Renaissance historiography is terrifying, right? There are some uh, medieval, especially between the 13th and 14th century historiography was actually much more to the point and spot on um, on on actual tactics than the one of the following centuries was because literally the Renaissance detached the authors from from the battlefields 
and kind of they, they insisted more on the narrative. So that's why, in part, the modernistic historiography has been kind of, um, uh, let's say, distracted by the treaties by saying, oh, look, for the first time, this great modernity, they finally made a treaty where it was written how to fight, how those imbeciles before didn't know how to. Um, and this is the typically idiotic modernistic mentality for which they think they think that if, in order to have a treatise, they think that what is written in it uh, is how they actually vote. Um, and first of all, this means that you haven't even studied the Von Krieg uh, and where von Clausewitz uh, explains not just what what war actually is and how it works, but it also exposes the the issues and the problems, and this is something we knew, in fact, since the 19th century, but people in the 21st evidently are too lazy um, to even just open a book, right? So um, that's how eventually things happen. But um, they, they, in fact, they don't tell us exactly how they fought, right? The stories are, you know, the accounts are somewhat foggy. They can't give us a detail about one thing, but overall, this a scientific reconstruction of how a, a clash had actually occurred was very difficult to do. It, it's always difficult to do, but properly at the time, the historiography lacked the capacity of reconstructing uh, military history like we would do today, right? With the uh, with the uh, with the evidence that also the the good military, the few, very few good military historians, of course, can gather also from the same sources of the time. But in fact, we need a further studying, right? It's not written. On a, not even on a, on a manual that was very often quite ideal and also inspired to, I don't know, Maurice of Nassau was uh, thinking to copy the, the, the Greeks and the Romans, right? And the, the system at the time was dramatically more advanced than the one of antiquity, but it was a renaissance thing to pretend it, right? To, to have this almost aestheticistic, metaphysicistic idea that, you know, reality had to be based on this abstract geometric principles and of course warfare was fought in a very different way but these were the same uh, authors that eventually led the troops in, into battle and so even just understanding that they themselves realized it was two different things would be you know at least the, the basics that before approaching su some such um, literary genre you, you should should take in consideration but anyhow um, and since the Dutch infantry around 1600 fought, deployed to a depth of 10 rows, it's clear that in order to maneuver in this way, a very advanced training was needed, was necessary. And, and this had to be studied uh, at, at a table, right, considering what could be the better options to make properly the uh, the troops making even this evolutions again sometimes th there were literally dances traditional dances that were used to make uh, soldiers making pirouettes uh, within the uh, corridors that separated the pike uh, squares to shoot and leaving you know space to to the to the rest of the troops encircling it was very again uh, very ingenious right it would happen in different ways on the battlefield compared to what these treatises said. It's just they they were starting to take in consideration the problem per se, right? And there were also training manuals, um, manuals of drill manuals properly. The first one with illustrated plates was printed in Amsterdam, famously enough, um, in 1607. I inserted most of the uh, pictures of it here. And it, it would take a long time for the benefits of standardized training um, and the need for a manual to be accepted by all officers. But still, this was a very effective, um, as the Dutch reform certainly foreshadowed the future evolution of military art. Right? Standardization was uh, a need uh, of command, first of all. Right, the the idea I mean, even just of um, affording troops that had to be trained, equipped, all in the same way it was something that the Dutch could pioneer because their army was made up in almost entirely of mercenaries. Actually, it was not um, properly a, a national levy. It was 
something else. And this man, right, if you wonder why the Dutch also uh, speeded up the, the process um, in this uh, military uh, development, is because they, they, they could afford to pay professionals, right? This this um, reforms in the hands of militia would have, would have not even not even been tried because they would have lacked the, the means right of perform properly they would have been incapable uh, of of performing them and there would have been much greater problems to solve uh, not just tactically or strategically but probably of how to levy them how to train them in, in a different way right so that's why the Dutch begin this before because they can afford those troops that are also in fact professionals so they can afford a higher degree of uniformity that was not seen before and therefore they start reasoning like you know instead of spending our energies of trying to put a patchy army together like it was typical of, of Europe in previous times even at least some of the um, of the armies were as advanced as we've seen the Spanish for example were were really uh, experimenting the same things in their own army but in general and also if you see how the Dutch themselves emerged right they they had to start from they had the privilege of starting from scratch in a sense uh, that also was a very important deal um, and in part also confronting with a hell of, of an enemy like the Spanish Tercio and um, managing to think however more uh continuatively more intensively also because war was literally non-stop right or at least it was incredibly intense and they were fighting repeatedly from escaping annihilation and therefore when when you see that also war stops and you know things are relaxed you realize what the dynamic in general really was right practice makes everything in warfare and that's why for the first time we find a more dedicated uh, attention also to the more general problem because there is just more need and also availability to start thinking in a more theoretical way with some uh, let's say even these uh, drill manuals are of course directed to officers that eventually would take matters in their own hands but um, that by being provided this kind of standard idea of what a unit should be drilled and equipped like etc would uh, increase the fluidity of the organization of tactics and so on and so render on, on, on the battlefield the life of the job of commanders at least easier right to rely on more fact responsive troops that are already kind of more or less um, let's say in fact in turn reliable on a, on a more standard fashion for which you don't have to wonder uh, let's say the on the differences of each unit and you can just know that they will tend to do uh, not just to perform something that but that altogether no they they already know how to perform that right in a without spending other energy for, for telling that. The infantry of the 16th and the 17th centuries still also relied on armor, right? Albeit reduced to the essential. There was a significant difference even in salary between the pikemen who could provide themselves with helmets and armor and those who fought without other armament than the pika, the dry pike. Uh, and uh, this is important naturally because in warfare normally the first ranks had always been the the better armored right um, there were differences this especially when uh, there were throwaway troops that could be sent like say to to massacre in part but this brutal means more recall like the the medieval mongol ones than anything in, in western warfare yes the, the front line was always made up by people with better equipment from which also more was expected also because as we've seen before uh, the frontline pikemen were the ones more directly exposed to, to to the shot and they were at the same time the ones who opened uh, who led the file right so troops uh, are the you know the, the pike squares were drilled to perform very complex maneuvers but exactly for this reason it was an internal order 
that was based exactly on the reliance on uh, on the guy in front of you and the the habituation right on the properly on, on the on the common drill on the base of the smaller units that also shared great part of their military life together they they kind of knew each other it was an esprit uh, the core so um these um elements were not uh, expandable right formations have uh, an internal order that cannot be altered right uh, they couldn't change uh, front without manu without wheeling right you can't re simply just okay i turned the soldiers and that worked out you, the, the the formation basically doesn't work right it just is also geometrically there are problems because uh the uh, space occupied in 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 front and in depth is is different and you can't simply turn the people within so um the the front the the file openers were very important and the ones that also needed frankly more more attributes because the kind of things you would see on on a 6th and 17th century battlefield I mean it's not they had in terms of of uh existentially dis destructive and traumatically um irreversible uh experience frankly had nothing to envy any other uh you know battlefield in history and the the growing importance of musketeers however gradually reduced that of defensive armor uh, and over time also began to cause some doubts about the visibility of deploying infantry in deep and massive formations suitable for pike handling but very less that for firearms this was evident since the beginning of renaissance warfare because at that point firearms had become so um, widespread and powerful that uh, at some point it was simply better to equip troops uh, with with them than than with armor if, if you had to choose between the two right and this is not just because of the you know even not making the soldier too heavy on the battlefield in the 16th century still at this point there were uh, metal shields that were literally conceived to to parry shots and they would because also you know compared to to later gunfire technology <laughs> these guns were were ridiculous but the um the fact is that still investing say the same amount of money to to provide uh for, for that equipment in in firearms instead would have been more performing and the best defense at that point would become your 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 firepower right so the, the ability in which you can fence away simply the enemy in front of you rather than the armor and that's the reason why armor factually disappears from the battlefields uh, by the by the 18th century because again it was uh, the 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 best way you could survive was having a cohesive unit that could create that volume of fire that would wipe out whoever they had in the front right loading them with armor would have been at that point practically useless and and counterproductive in terms of cost ratio uh, benefits right and it was obvious that aside from the individual uh, and his armor and, and or guns this uh, ratio was ever more evident also in, in, in the formation the collective at the collective level because what was happening now is that pikemen were under a much greater amount of fire and in order to supply for for the losses they would have theoretically to become ever you know uh, an ever deeper formation which uh, would have meant other men and you know where do you find them and especially why would you find send them to, to die against musketry fire at that point it was better to invest more on the musket thinning the line so also basically trying to uh, outflank uh, the enemy at least creating this line of fire that could avoid could, could prevent you being outflanked at the same time and uh, evidently admitting that the musket now was becoming the, the most effective weapon for any any infantryman gradually uh, out there um, and the uh, at that point it was also uh, necessary to uh, reason in fact as we've just seen on the uh, 
on, on a different type of tactics altogether, more flexible, mobile one where you had essentially uh, a larger front uh, but thinner lines and therefore the uh, also the coming back of cavalry on the battlefield was, was important especially to protect the flanks right and or at this point telling the truth having still kind of d multiple battle lines because what was happening in practice was still you had square blocks were however thinner and they had ever an ever greater amount of musketeers on, on the sides and in, in, in mul still in in um, multiple lines however of battle that were conceived like that and uh, that resembles still the um, the kind of in-depth uh, formation that had been the renaissance one up to that point because the pike squares were not just massive formations per se because if you don't have thousands in, 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 a, in a block you don't really you can't really work as a as a pikeman formation altogether you need really mass but also there were multiple pike squares scattered on the battlefield to create kind of a in-depth kind of a labyrinth in which uh, you know other troops were there to, to enter or even cavalry etc but with arquebusiers and or musketeers um, shooting at them kind of trying to, to repel them and therefore having this this this, this elephantiac system kind of approaching one another quite um, in a quite kind of goofy way than trying to, to, to wear each other out by shooting each other advancing where the line seemed weaker etc but uh, advancing required a previous adequate softening up of the enemy lines that had to occur through the shot so uh, it was complicated right and and these battles as you know were were very often also inconclusive because especially the um, the the lack of cavalry on inconsistent um, tactical um, say impact meant that you couldn't even that was the problem you, pro you couldn't break the square so it could even retreat unbroken right uh, this this still happened in Napoleonic times right you know there were so there, there, there was a regiment of Saxons at at uh, I think hours that that retreated in in square formation. We're talking about Napoleonic times. You can imagine, like in the 16th century, where cavalry was reduced to a minimum, and the entire solidity of the formation was the uh, was was essentially preventing from from a major breakthrough, right, in a more scientific way. And that that's why he said the musket gradually very gradually dynamicize all the system because it thins the line and extends the front and therefore allows for more movement right more more flanking out flanking and stimulating the bro it, it, all in a system that was ever bo actually more expensive because naturally all the, the muskets the production the, the gunpowder etc costed an atrocious lot the cavalry was also coming back with all its incredible logistical needs Artillery too was was the other um, you know important factor in the battlefield at this point. It was not really conceived to uh, to cause uh, physically major losses. It was just hammering the enemy, but it was increasing in capacity in that sense. So also was um, uh, you know that you know normally even shooting there was no such thing like a precision shooting with artillery. It was just like a uh, an area fire right and so um, just to hammer psychologically the enemy right and um, the concentration of firepower on the battlefield was also from that direction was increasing so um, it was important to make lines thinner because otherwise the the pike squares would have been exposed to, to greater uh, you know threat posed by properly by artillery in that sense and consider that on a, on a lesser scale, look at Marignano that marks the end of the Swiss that based their system exclusively on, on the square. You have literally, you know, this pikeman butchered, cut to pieces, exploded because of, of, of the cannonades that arrived on them. It was quite, you know, contingent. It was just they, front, they found themselves in front of the artillery in a way. So again, this was not the normality on the battlefields. It wouldn't be normality even 200 years later because artillery was never conceived to, to inflict damage, physical damage, deaths 
right on the infantry right it was too um too few in that the, all the effect was psychological um and musketry fire by far and at this time still bikes were the uh the 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 element that caused more deaths on the battlefields uncomparably also called steel by cavalry more than artillery right artillery was literally the least and especially uh, in these early times so uh, everything was moving in this direction of the thinning of, of, of the lines um, deploying uh, the troops in a formation that would allow them to, to optimize cooperation between the various weapons they were equipped with became one of the main problems for the generals now also for the military theorists to core um, at the time uh, because evidently uh, this new system was much more stimulating it, it opened to greater a greater amount of options the many and elaborate solutions proposed had in common the tendency to thin the formation so that the infantry masses of the 16th and 17th centuries became something very different of course from the primitive massive square of the Swiss bikemen because uh, it, by the mid 15th century uh, the uh, the a uh, pike square uh, capable w with enough collective training to advance offensively which had never been seen in medieval times uh, in a decisive fashion on the battlefields could not be stopped practically by anyone as we've seen the firepower was still low because crossbows alone couldn't take out um, infantry en masse uh, to, to be the size. They didn't have the power. Uh, the firearms existed but there were a few right and even in fact the same Swiss had some some very few scattered initially in their own even some artillery but what we just said about artillery I think even about in the Middle Ages was relatively uh, irrelevant. Cavalry was more a problem but again the pike is the best arm that you can use against it especially you know if if this infantry is so speedy that very often the same uh, enemy doesn't realize where when where you're coming from and uh, you can easily disrupt their their plans in the base of combined arms that they, they thought so that even cavalry alone doesn't doesn't quite make it like in the Burgundian Wars uh, and and so at that point it was easy to work like that. When the Spanish introduced combined arms of arquebusiers, pikemen, uh, you know, think this was kind of loose, right? Uh, they, they, for their own fortune, telling the truth for Switzerland altogether, they remain entrenched in Switzerland for their future success as a country. Uh, but at the time, they're basically taken out of the battlefields. And at first, the most successful formation was as you know, during the first half of the 16th century, the Spanish Tercio, which combined a dozen companies uh, for a total that could reach two or three thousand pikemen and arquebusiers in a formation up to 30 rows deep. Right, so that you couldn't, I mean, thinking of breaking it frontally, it's just it had to have a head to head between the two formations. And it was practically nothing else that could break it unless you know they were properly cold from from the rare etc but they were massive formations as well so um they were difficult to outflank and they were protected by firepower as well etc the depth of the tertio was less than half that of the swiss phalanx consider that so that's how early the shot had actually obliged the infantry to thin its lines because of the difficulty that it kind of the the stopping power that it could present f for a while right so that the thinner pike line was already understood for the sake of mobility and uh, tactical exploitation to be more convenient right and you know how slow and bulky the system already seems even just from a second half of the 16th century perspective but already the, since the beginning that had been the case because the swiss phalanx was just about this frontal move it was um win or lose uh, through that advance it was the entire thing 
right? And, and on which everything depended on. Uh, you know, a combined arm system with a shot, this had immediately changed, right? And already in his own times, of course, this, this, um, the third theory of formation began to appear too massive. And so the, the need of thinning the pike line had never stopped. It, it was always uh, a necessity in a sense. And uh, the just the tactical contingencies had, uh, say, obliged that state of also well, kind of stall, right? This were, was a new system that had emerged suddenly after all and um, the the major powers of, of the time were kind of struggling to, to give up a, a form to it and so the um, the change was continuous right was always the concern of the commanders and theorists of, of the time and at the end of the 16th century, as we've seen, in line with the growing role of firearms, a preference emerged for even smaller and more manageable formations of a thousand men or, or even fewer to be deployed in a smaller number of rows. And these formations were generally called battalions, with a term that was already in common use in the Middle Ages to indicate the tactical subdivisions of an army and which uh, has remained in use with the same meaning to this day, practically, even though uh, organics works uh, differently, of course. Um, but uh, the concept of this, say, more tactically protagonistic uh, unit carrying out independent operations is somewhat um, conceptually the, the same was at the time. And it doesn't necessarily mean even it was commanded by directly by the, the, the officer in the first line, right? They, it was commanded from, from the rear because it's rather the companies that, ha that are the last units from which the, you know, the individually the, the, the commander controls the whole thing, knows all the troops, right? And each battalion comprises a sturdy core of pikemen lined up to a depth of 10 rows while arquebuses and muskets were deployed on the flanks or the corners to maximize their fire potential. Because these elements had to coordinate among each other. Right? And that's why the, um, it, it's the same difference in arms that required this more independent, in fact, subunits of the battalion to cooperate for the functionality of, of the wall. And with um, also with an importance of, in fact, the, the, the shot that was greater than, uh, than anything that had existed historically before, exactly because the, this kind of light, what would have, it was still light infantry, would, would transform by the end of the 17th century into heavy infantry, because it would be the one that would hold the line, well, the line of battle. Now, the need to ensure cooperation between the different battalions inspired the idea of the brigade as well, a term that is still used today to indicate a grouping of units constituted for tactical and non-administrative purposes that is also e on a grander scale, of course, than the battalion. And during the Thirty Years' War, the King of Sweden, Gustavus Adolphus, as we've seen, tried to group in his brigades alternating units of pikemen and musketeers in a sort of mobile fortress able to cope in all directions and clearly inspired by military architecture of, of the time but more commonly the different battalions of a brigade lined up side by side right or one behind the other uh, on the old kind of depth in depth uh, style in order to support each other in a more flexible way because the uh, at this point the, the collapse of the front line was still considered since kind of it was medieval times um, more um, say habitual to risk altogether the uh, the solidity of the formation uh, in order, in fact, in, in later um, in later times, you know that 
you know, it was just a frontal clash between battle lines, like in 18th century linear tactics that is called exactly like this, there would be either one, say, the, 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 the line would be broken in diff different sections, but those who had the strength to advance further and to, to, to outflank the enemy would take it all, right? So it was already conceived as, uh, like, all the firepower and kind of and resilience of the line that we can concentrate is uh, okay more standardized and and homogeneous in fact to to risk the solidity of the entire formation on at this point it wasn't like that still um, it was possible to disengage more easily because cavalry was still kind of um, a minor arm compared to 18th century times right so the 18th century was just even there either you 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 manage to break there were ways of disengaging even at the time but um, it's gonna depend on on a single line at this point still you could effectively if even if one section of the army broke you 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 didn't have uh, any uh, other arm threatening your flanks uh, if you had other infantry deployed behind right this is the reason because cavalry was too uh, was important was gaining importance but was still uh, incapable of breaking alone this 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 gaps right it's, it's mostly in the second half of the 17th century that that comes you know more prevalent right and and also because in fact the pikes were disappearing uh, from the battlefield. So that's the reason why this in-depth formation was already there. But if you consider, again, the Swedish army in some battles, in some employments, um, this idea of, of the linear tactics was already conceptually there. And that's why, in fact, why Gustavus Adolphus was, um, you know, is credited with, with that mostly, also Im improving dramatically also on this larger organic scale, this, the, the Dutch model, because it was obvious at that point that things would have kind of evolved in that direction, that linear direction, and um, and and so there you have in the Swedish army the first system that kind of functionalizes it on a larger scale towards that direction, but still it was not the thing, um, and on the uh, it's say in the long run, in fact, this type of organization was destined to prevail, at the same time causing a further reduction in depth of the formations. On the battlefields of the Thirty Years' War, the optimal depth of an infantry battalion was now reduced to six rows, right? And those generals who remained attached to deeper formations generally paid the consequences because they couldn't exploit as quickly uh, and with enough uh, tactical balance the opportunities that instead the musketry fire of a you know intensely drilled unit could could provide you with uh, on the battlefield and so also an important capacity of outflankment uh, that still these units could do because cavalry was relatively um, still kind of weak on, on the battlefield and uh, and things changed definitely in the 18th where instead everything comes back in line uh, with outflank kings that are performed most, it can be performed by infantry as well, they would, but also with a more preferential use of cavalry that didn't have uh, any pike kind of uh, deployed in depth to, to create uh, the problem, right? And with uh, battle lines that were uh, outstretched uh, in width uh, exactly to, to, to avoid, say, this uh, outflank. Um, so, as you see, it it goes all step by step. It's, it's not a simply sinusoidal trend, uh, because the the arms here basically become three, right? It, two is still is the same infantry, but it's a different type of infantry, right? So missile, melee, and cavalry, um, plus artillery that is used in an ever more dynamic way as well, also to support the musketry fire. So nothing here is like you you can still mix the wool stuff by some degree and there is an ever greater um combined arms um uh, cooperation but exactly because of that also a, a greater functionalization of the same towards one type 
a, a better defined role so that by the end of the 17th century we also have field artillery really making an important difference uh, infantry has become all musketeers and cavalry there makes the the uh, the main attacks and uh, in open field and outflanking maneuvers and and pursuit and all um, however for today i stop it here we will keep talking about this topics for today just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time